Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. I'm Mark Stein in for Tucker this evening. The National Football League is back, but a six-month hiatus has done nothing to alleviate the protest epidemic gripping the league. Two players on the Miami Dolphins knelt during the national anthem before last night's preseason opener. Other players raised their fists during the anthem or simply walked around. The protests served to reignite the NFL's feud with the president. Today, President Trump tweeted, quote, the NFL players are at it again, taking a knee when they should be standing proudly for the national anthem. Numerous players from different teams wanted to show their outrage at something that most of them are unable to define. They make a fortune doing what they love. Be happy, be cool. A football game that fans are paying so much money to watch and enjoy is no place to protest. Most of that money goes to the players anyway. Find another way to protest. Stand proudly for your national anthem or be suspended without pay. The tweet was immediately labeled as racist by the president's foes. Commander-in-Chief is, in fact, the racial opportunist-in-chief in this country. He's using race to incite the base. Trump has, uh, has, has, has embraced his racism himself. He continues to do this kind of uh, uh, IQ insult against African Americans. Donald Trump himself is a racist and a white supremacist. That's all there is to it. So he's a racist because uh, people are expected to stand for the national anthem. Burgess Owens is a retired NFL player and author of the book, Why I Stand, and he joins us now. Burgess, how long is this going to go? Is it, we're in for another season of it. Are we in for five, <coughs> ten, twenty seasons? Is this a permanent breach uh, with the national anthem as a communal ritual observed by all Americans? Well, I, I tell you, th thank you, Mark, and look forward to chatting with you. Um, uh, there's no question, uh, it's hard to believe we're into a third season. And uh, unfortunately, the way this works out, the players are the ones who can take the brunt of this. Not only are they going to be impacted in their career, some of them will, will end their career, but they'll be impacted later on when they try to get a job and realize that uh, they have demeaned their own brand. But we need to look at the source. The source is that when is the NFL uh, management going to get their act together right. and stop playing these guys and stop playing this, uh, our, own, uh, our, our, uh, our country. <clears throat> they have a choice of setting the rules that every other organization sets. Nobody shows up to work and protest because they would feel like protesting, not if they yeah. want to keep a job. Yeah. And these young men, unfortunately, uh, have not been taught in their home about respect. Uh, they think they can get, out, get away with it in, in, in the real world, and it's not going to happen. It's gonna be, they're going to pay the price for it, and the owners, again, will move their business on and, and do things in a global fashion. How can you be uh, so, because you've, you've stood for the national anthem in public on sports, uh, in sports stadiums <coughs> for, for years. How can uh, players be so narcissistic that they think a national anthem is an opportunity for self-expression, regardless of whether they're pumping their fists or taking a knee or standing upside down and twiddling their toes? Why would you think that's something to do in a national anthem? Well, it's because uh, I grew up in a different generation, like Jim Brown and Lynn Swan and Hank, uh, Franco Harris. Uh, we would kind of get teary-eyed looking at the flag during the time we played mm -hmm. because we, were, we had gratitude. We had parents, we had a dad who taught us about respect, about uh, not only respecting our, our, ourselves, our family, our, uh, the women, but our country and being appreciative of it. And these young men, unfortunately, 70 percent of them don't have dads. And this all goes back, Mark, to the real crux of this. We have an issue in the, in, behind the curtains mm -hmm. with these socialists. What they've done to the black community and the black family the last 30, 40 years is a crying shame. Uh, they're put, continually pumping out 75% of black boys in the state of California right. last year right. cannot pass a simple reading and writing test. That's what we're dealing with. So it's an issue with understanding our, our country and our history and being proud of it. You mentioned the owners. Uh, there's a, a significant <coughs> loss of revenue and there's a significant loss of audience. I meet people all the time who say, the NFL's dead to me. I'm not going back to it. Uh, how much more of this are they going to, they, they want to take a third season of this? How much damage to their brand can they take? Realize these guys are not clueless. They're uh, leftist globalists. They just paid the commission $40 million this last year, every year for five mm -hmm. years, and only $4 million of that is guaranteed because they see the incentive 
internationally. As they, they topped out at $13 billion a couple years ago and lost 20% of that right. in the last couple of years, they're looking at $25 billion globally with their NFL international uh, uh, teams. <laughs> uh, NFL, China, China, NFL, China players, NFL, uh, France players, uh, French players, uh, uh, Korea, you name it. They have put in place a, a, a global strategy yeah. for TV, global TV revenue, and believe me, they don't mind giving up the American fan to do that. That's what they do. Use, abuse, and discard. That's the leftist way. Thank, thanks for that, Burgess. I remember that uh, game at Wembley Stadium where they all took a knee for the Star Spangled Banner and then got to their feet for God Save the Queen, an extraordinary sight. Uh, Chris Hahn is a radio host and former staffer to Chuck Schumer. Uh, he joins us. Uh, Chris, uh, you agree with this, that the president, by uh, defending the national anthem, is being a racist? Uh, you know, I don't know that he's being a racist, but it surely does uh, appeal to a certain racist part of his base. I'm not saying his whole base is racist, but there are definitely people who this appeals to, and he's picking a fight once again with a black ath athlete in an attempt to distract us from an economy that, while growing for some, is pro producing inflation that <laughs> is really hurting others, particularly people in his base. Yeah, but that, that's got, uh, the, the, the fact that they're black athletes, uh, the flag, the national anthem, there's very few things in a republic that are supposed to be for everybody, that we all agree on, particularly in fractious times. Yep. Uh, it's not in your interest, is it, to make standing for the national anthem just a thing that right-wing conservatives do? <laughs> No, look, I always stand for the anthem, but I thank God every day I live in a country where I don't have to. This is America. You are free to protest. And in fact, taking a knee during the national anthem has been discussed as a reasonable, appropriate, and very respectful no, protest. No, no, no. We That's... should really be dealing... We should really... Oh, absolutely. You, you speak to people over the years with the vet, within veterans communities and others. This is a... Finally, this is a very respectful uh, way to protest. People, they're not people out there. They're no. not out there. There's people pumping fists. They're walking around. You can take a knee for King George the Third. You got rid of George the Third, so you don't take the knee. You stand up for the national. The point about a national anthem is everybody's got to do the same thing for it, or it's not a national anthem anymore. But. You know, the point of living in a democratic republic is everybody could do what they want to do, particularly yeah. around a song being played at an event. It is right. freedom. You do not fight for the flag or the anthem. Not, you fight for the freedoms that the flag and the anthem no, no, represents. No, no, because no, it's not a First Amendment issue. I have a First Amendment right to uh, shout F words at your grandmother's funeral. But it's not something that should be done. And to defend, it, to defend <laughs> it as an abstract right is absurd. Any civilized society depends on people having a uh, respecting minimal social norms. It's nothing even to do with America. Yeah. If you're if you're at a, yeah, if, me... if you're at an international game and they play the Canadian anthem or the French anthem or the German anthem, uh, or like with these Jacksonville Jaguar players who stood up for God Save the Queen at Wembley Stadium, they understood with a foreign anthem that it's polite and seemly to get to your feet, but not with their own anthem. Let me, let me just explain this to you, because you may not have learned this mm -hmm. in school. In a free society like ours, mm -hmm. you do not have to stand compulsory for anything. No. You can do what you want to do as long as you are not hurting others. There is no law that says stand. We don't work. We don't live in the in, in the age of, of 1984 where you do what the party tells no, no, you. No, in let America, me, let me explain, you, let you can me, peacefully protest no, whenever you want, no, no, wherever me, you want. Let me explain something to you, Chris, since we're all explaining things to each other. Of course not. Everyone accepts that there's a legal right to do things. There's a legal right to be a right. boorish, narcissistic, multi-million dollar buffoon who doesn't understand uh, a, a basic societal norm uh, like yeah, standing for the anthem of a society right that has enriched him. <laughs> uh, defending this kind right. of narcissistic, self-indulgent buffoonery uh, as some abstract freedom is completely ridiculous. I accept that no one's going to throw them in jail. Bob Mueller isn't going to indict them and toss them in jail for 200 years over it, but it's still not something that you guys should be defending. Hey, look, I am defending people's rights to express themselves peacefully without bothering other people. I respect that right. And look, the president has bigger things to worry about mm. than whether a couple of athletes are kneeling 
on Sunday. And I know it's a double whammy for him here on this anniversary of his, of his ridiculous remarks after Charlottesville. It's a double whammy because the NFL rejected him many years ago, wouldn't let him buy a team. Uh. So he gets that, and he gets to, to charge up his base. And that is, look, we need the president focusing on bringing people together, not pulling them apart over this. Well, there's no point bringing if people. Be, if, there's if, no point bringing people together who can't even agree on the national anthem. You might as well say, well, uh, "Let's have wake me up before you go go for white people and the macarena for black people uh, and for transgender bathroom protests." We can have a completely different anthem. Thank you for thank you, know, you for that, the, Chris. He, he, yeah, carry on. You get a last right, Thank word. you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Here, Thanks a lot. Here's Chris. the thing. Here's the thing. We respect the anthem, but we also respect people's right to do what they want in this country. Okay, we'll see how that works out. We'll see if there's enough societal glue left when there's not enough for a national anthem. Democrats um, across the country are turning against Nancy Pelosi. Is it time for her to step down? And if so, who can replace her? That's next on Tucker Carlson tonight. Nancy Pelosi has led Democrats in the House of Representatives for more than 15 years. And more and more of those Democrats are fed up. As of today, more than 50 Democrat congressmen and congressional candidates say they would not support Mrs. Pelosi for Speaker if the party retakes the majority. You will have a vote as part of the Democratic caucus as to who will be the next Democratic leader, whether it be the minority leader or the Speaker of the House. Will you vote for Nancy Pelosi? Probably not. You have said you will not support Nancy Pelosi should you become uh, elected there as the next speaker or Democratic leader in the House. Folks are ready for a new generation of leadership. Would you back Pelosi for speaker if you win and are in the House? Well, I think, again, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Hmm. Mark Penn was a pollster and advisor to both Bill and Hillary Clinton. And uh, he joins us. Mark, uh, 15 years in the modern age is a hell of a long time to be holding down a, a, a party leadership job like this. Is Nancy finally in trouble? Uh, I, I think trouble's kind of overrated here. Look, if the Democrats win the House, she will have done the fundraising, the messaging. Uh, she will be in a very strong position and she will be strengthening herself most likely in California, and the California delegation is solidly behind her. So I don't actually think she's going anywhere if, if she wins. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are a fair number of politicians that for the purpose of the election, because she's unpopular nationally, want to distance themselves from her. And I think eventually there will be a change. And the other thing that could happen here is the Problem Solvers Caucus. If this race is within five or six seats on either way, Democrats or Republicans, they may hold up the election for speaker unless there are rules changes that put some power back in the members hands well let's let's just step back and uh, and talk about what you said at the beginning about whether she is in in trouble or not uh, once upon a time if you were a loser uh, you got a second chance uh, whether it's uh, Grover Cleveland Richard Nixon whoever it is we're talking about we live in much more brutal political times and Nancy Pelosi hasn't actually won Mm -hmm. uh, in the House for 10 years now, for five, uh, uh, four elections and possibly a fifth. How is it, what's the secret of her power there? How is it she's managed to hold her grip on this caucus? Uh, California, uh, fundraising, mm. uh, personality and organization. Uh, and remember, what's happened here is that the fundraising and the political campaigns largely got centralized, giving more power to the leaders. Right. That's one of the big reasons nothing gets done on both <laughs> sides, because the leaders have too much power and the members aren't free to go agree on stuff. Well, let, let's turn from uh, the minority leader to a well-known New York City madam, not any connection between the two of them, but the self-described Manhattan madam, uh, Kristen Davis, testified today before the Mueller investigation's grand jury. Uh, why she did that is unclear, but Miss Davis has been a friend to longtime Trump advisor Roger Stone. If you have difficulty keeping your metropolitan madams straight, this is the one who claimed to have uh, provided hookers 
for uh, Elliot Spitzer, who was uh, then the Democrat governor of New York. Mark, what's, what, how did the Mueller investigation uh, end up uh, calling the Manhattan Madam before the grand jury? Well, look, I lived through 98, so I know that there are no rocks which special counsels mm. will stop from turning over. Mm. And I think it's unfortunate that the special counsel's gone down this road. I think Roger Stone has been clear. He didn't collude with anybody. He was up to maybe some of his usual political tricks and, and bragging, and they're obviously interviewing everybody around him regardless of the connection just as they're interviewing everybody around Trump. Quite interestingly one of Roger Stone's other associates, I think of Mr. Miller, appealed the subpoena and I think although it was turned down at the district mm. level it's actually the most fascinating case which might be the case that unravels the entire independent counsel investigation if it's appealed. Yeah, because the way this thing, I and mean, that, that is a very interesting appeal, because this thing doesn't meet any basic judicial norms, uh, what the special counsel does. Basically, he goes down the chain, so he wants to talk to this, uh, this madam, because she's got something on some other guy, and then uh, he can put the squeeze on that other guy, and the other guy can roll up another guy, and eventually, somewhere in that chain, they'll find someone who has the goods on Trump. Uh, well, why do Democrats and Republicans put up with this? Why isn't there a bipartisan understanding of the need to get rid of this thing? Uh, look, I, I wish there were. I, I fought Ken Starr in 98, and I've been outspoken that I think this investigation is wrong. Well, look, I think Judge Ellis in the Manafort trial mm. clearly knows that Manafort is on trial by the independent counsel with the entire weight of the largest prosecutorial machinery right. almost ever built, only because he spent two months as Trump campaign manager. Yeah, absolutely. He might have had an assessment, he might have had a trial, but not two indictments, not the... In the in no. Not even, even without bail, even Harvey Weinstein is out on a million dollars bail. Right, right. So you, you, you see that this is not the way anybody really expect the American justice system uh, to work. And it, I am puzzled that more Democrats and Republicans, look, hatred for Trump is so broad well, that I think people are forgetting the first principles is that we all have to agree on a system that's fair to all. Ab absolutely. We'll get into Judge Ellis and the Manafort trial a little later on the show. Mark Zuckerberg has more of your personal information than perhaps anyone in human history, but he's not got enough and he wants more. He's asking banks to share their customers' financial information with him. That's up next. Every time you log into Facebook, you aren't consuming a product, you're becoming one. The company relies on your personal data to make money, and now it's trying to get even more of it. Recent reports say the company is contacting major U.S. banks, seeking detailed financial data about the bank's customers for the sake of crafting more services to entice Facebook users. Roger McNamee co-founded Elevation Partners and was a mentor to Mark Zuckerberg. Since then, he's become a critic of Facebook, and he joins us now. Uh, Roger, if uh, any uh, government entity was doing what Facebook does, uh, liberals in particular would be outraged about it. You remember how after 9-11 they went bananas over the Patriot Act because they thought George W. Bush was tracking what library books uh, people were taking out. That sounds quaint now. Facebook knows more about uh, two and a half billion people on the planet mo knows more about more people than anybody has ever known about anyone. Where's it going to stop? Yeah, Mark, it's really, really infuriating because Facebook has within its core product as many active users as there are total members of Christianity. So right. we're talking about the largest entity in business that has ever existed. Mm. And their business is surveillance. They capture everything. And what's particularly galling about this issue with the banks is it's not like they're going to offer a new service. No. As a as a uh, consumer at a bank, you have access to web services to allow you to get all the stuff you want. But Facebook wants to get that data because with that data, they're going to know a lot more about you and they're going to be able to manipulate your attention to their economic benefit and they're going to be able to use that data with third parties to get paid as well. And so my advice to everyone is 
if by some reason your bank chooses to go along with this, do not do this. This is just a really, really bad idea. And you, you, I wish Facebook would recognize that the game has changed and they need to behave differently. You say, you say that, but as a practical matter, I mean, I, say, I suppose they're going after major banks. So I suppose if you want to transfer your checking account uh, to the First National Bank of Dead Moose Junction uh, somewhere in the main woods, they might not have done a deal with Facebook. But it's increasingly well, harder to actually avoid Mark Zuckerberg's tentacles. It, it is very difficult. The good news on this particular one is you would still have to uh, take the little piece of software in Facebook Messenger that works with your specific mm. bank. So you always have the ability to opt out in mm. this case. The problem with Facebook, as you pointed out, Mark, is that in so many areas, you've not had any way to opt out. All of this stuff has been done to you. And the sad thing is most of us don't even realize that this has been going on. There is so much data no. that's been gathered. And the way it's being used is stuff that you don't realize that's where the data is coming from. And you don't realize that this is being done to harm you. And my simple point to everybody is that the days of trusting tech companies to do the right thing are in the past now and we all have to approach the stuff with skepticism I'm not saying don't use new tech I'm saying make sure you understand what the consequences are when you see a product like Alexa or Google Home which right. listens in your home all the time yeah, yeah. there are a lot of reasons why that's just a terrible terrible idea and it's not you know it's convenient to have the thing bring up the songs you want to listen to right but it's not worth having it Spy on you all the time. No, it's a, it's a high. Th thank you for that, Roger. It's an amazing thing that, in order to, for the convenience of having uh, them know that you like Justin Bieber but not Miley Cyrus, uh, you're willing to be surveilled 24 hours a day. It's an extraordinary world we live in. Well, it's basically uh, a, a 24 hour ankle bracelet that two and a half billion people are wearing around the planet. Thank, thank you very much. Way to put your finger on it. Yeah. My pleasure, my friend. Thanks so much. Thanks Have a, a lot. great weekend. And you. A California Republican congressional candidate recently learned what it's like to have powerful tech companies dictate what can and cannot be said. Elizabeth Heng created this campaign ad. In Cambodia, under Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge, being young and single often meant a gruesome life and likely death. They approached my father and in order to save his life, he said he was about to be married. They asked him, to whom? He pointed to the prettiest girl that he saw, having never spoken to her before. 41 years later, they're still the happiest couple I know. Great things can come from great adversity. Facebook blocked that ad on the grounds that it contained, quote, shocking, disrespectful, or sensational content. They have since relented in the face of public backlash. Elizabeth Heng joins us now. Elizabeth, at one level, this is extraordinarily stupid because this is actually your family's story. And Facebook is telling you that you telling your family's story is some kind of hate crime in their wacky world. Yeah, definitely. So I found it incredibly frustrating when I got into the race to run for Congress. A big part of my message mm. is that great things can come from great right. adversity. My parents survived the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and genocide, mm. came to the United States as refugees, and for some reason, Facebook didn't like that message and revoked my ability to promote this um, ad on their platform. Now, uh, the Khmer Rouge, uh, in their uh, mercifully brief uh, time in Cambodia, managed to kill well over a million people. I mean, they were butchers. Mm -hmm. Pol Pot and his allies were butchers on a, an incredible scale. Do you think it's just that uh, some twit at Facebook who's got no memory of anything before 2012 thinks that somehow uh, your ad was promoting genocide? Are they really that stupid? No, you know, and we just constantly see how this is an attack uh, from liberal tech companies mm. um, that continue to go after conservative voices. Right. This, 
that what I showed were just glimpses of genocide. Um, my family lived through it. Mm. For a tech company to be able to say what history lives on, I find highly problematic. Well, that's an absolutely critical point because uh, the point you're making there is it's not just that Facebook dominates our present and our future, but they're basically unilaterally deciding for themselves what part of the past we're allowed to know about. So, for example, what happened in Cambodia, uh, some uh, social justice pajama boy at Facebook decides that that simply can be erased and two and a half billion Facebook users aren't entitled to see it. Yeah, and the fact that it took, I try to go through the normal protocols when it was first revoked, mm. and when I, to no avail, right. I took this publicly, it took five days and a whole national movement yep. in order for them to say, I apologize for the confusion. <laughs> Had I been, I say, a liberal in Los Angeles, uh. I don't think that this would have taken five days and a national movement, because no. my bigger concern is what if this happened five days before an election? No, you're, absol you're absolutely right. And, you're, and, and people who aren't in a position to go uh, public uh, have a much more difficult time. Elizabeth, thanks for that. Thanks for your inspiring story and your family story, and good luck in your election. Uh, Paul Manafort's criminal trial in Virginia has produced no end of excitement, thanks in part to the uh, unusual behavior of the uh, presiding judge. He threw another curveball at prosecutors today. That's coming up next on Tucker Carlson Tonight. Paul Manafort's trial in Virginia grows more gnarled and confusing by the day. The prosecution planned to wrap up its case today, but Judge T.S. Ellis III mysteriously halted testimony today for five hours without explanation. Alex Little is a criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor. He joins us now. Alex, uh, Good evening, Mark. what's the reason uh, for this somewhat mercurial judge's uh, five-hour delay today? We haven't got any confirmed reporting as to the exact reason. I think there are a few clues that have been reported. Um, the judge went into the jury room at, at one point. There was also the court reporter going into his chambers with the attorneys from both sides. That generally suggests that there's something going on with the jury, with possibly a juror who has been exposed to some information or may have said some things that he shouldn't have. And if that happens, there has to be a whole process, a hearing, where out of the presence of the, the public, the jurors have to be questioned about a series of things. Right. So it, it may just be that some uh, uh, jurors have been known to be behaving inappropriately. Uh, yes. the, the, the prosecution's view is that the, it's the judge who's been behaving inappropriately. He's been very hard on them. Uh, yesterday he told one of them to stop uh, uh, talking Crying, about this, yeah. uh, this loan uh, uh, that Manafort never mm. got and maybe move on to one that he actually did. Uh, I'm all in favor of being disrespectful to judges <laughs> uh, because uh, I think Americans are too deferential to judges generally. But in this case, uh, the, pros the prosecution is, uh, is showing its actual anger with the way the judge has conducted this trial. Well, it's interesting. You don't often see federal judges really come down hard on federal prosecutors. It's generally the other way around. Mm -hmm. They're in front of the same prosecutors, the prosecutors in front of the same judges day right. after day. But this judge is known to sort of be this way. He's, he's called himself the Caesar of his own small room there in Alexandria, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's unexpected behavior from Judge Ellis, but it certainly is unusual compared to other cases. Now, Mark Penn was on earlier, and he made the point that we all know that whatever the state of Paul Manafort's taxes, uh, the reason this trial is taking place is nothing to do with his tax returns from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever it is, but only because he worked for the Donald Trump campaign for a couple of months in 2016. Uh, is it a credible case given that, that underlying reality? Oh, it is a credible case. I mean, the evidence that's been presented is mm. pretty standard bank and tax fraud, the sort of case you'd see in pretty much every district of the United States brought by assistant U.S. attorneys. Um, the government does not take kindly to lying to banks. Banks really don't mm. like it, especially when you're talking about millions of dollars. Would it have this much focus if it were not Paul Manafort? Of course not. But these are pretty bread and, bre bread and butter cases for U.S. prosecutors. Uh, the, the star witness is this guy, Rick Gates, uh, yeah. who uh, it was revealed this week he stole money from 
Mr. Manafort's bank accounts to finance an extramarital affair in London? Does it actually come down to uh, the government's Mueller's witness, uh, his credibility versus Manafort's? It's certainly a key piece. Anytime you've got a cooperator who's providing sort of the inside account of criminal activity, the juror is going to be asked to determine whether that person is telling the truth. But the way prosecutors build these cases is they take that information and they corroborate it as much as they can with hard documents, emails, tax returns, financials, and they've done that here. And ultimately, that's what the jury is going to have to rely upon if they convict Paul Manafort. Well, we'll see how it uh, how it goes uh, as the uh, next week proceeds. Alex, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you. The stars are at war in Hollywood over Donald Trump. Kanye supports him while Spike Lee hates him. Their latest antics are up next. Hollywood stars are going to war with one another to defend or attack President Trump. On Jimmy Kimmel last night, the rapper Kanye West said he wouldn't be bullied by those shaming him for liking the president. Everyone around me tried to pick my candidate for me mm -hmm. and then told me every time I said I like Trump that I couldn't say it out loud or my career would be over I get kicked out the black community because blacks are we're supposed to have a monolithic thought we can only like we can only be Democrats and all you can't bully me liberals can't bully me news can't bully me the hip-hop community they can't bully me just a short while ago, the president tweeted, thank you to Kanye West and the fact that he is willing to tell the truth. One new and great fact, African-American unemployment is the lowest ever recorded in the history of our country. So honored by this. Thank you, Kanye, for your support. It is making a big difference. But film director Spike Lee told Anderson Cooper that in his view, Donald Trump wasn't his president at all. The President of the United States had a chance and said to denounce hate, hate groups. The whole world saw what happened and he didn't do it. Because since this guy's got in the White House, it's not even a dog whistle, it's a bullhorn. Would you want to sit down with Donald Trump? No. And have a, a conversation? I don't, I, I'm calling back. I don't use his name either. Mm. He's Agent Orange. Do you, do you consider him your president? No. Yeah, Carly Shimkus is a reporter with Fox News Headlines 24-7. Uh, Carly, Kanye West, uh, the president's tweeting about him now, he is unusual in that Extremely. he did this, he, 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 he spoke up for Trump, he spoke up for the president, uh, and he was clubbed and battered, but he stuck with it. So we can give him credit for sure, mm. for at mm. least being brave. Mm. I do think that some conservatives have jumped on the Kanye West bandwagon mm. a little bit too prematurely. He did make some very good uh, uh, points about freedom of thought when he declared his support for the mm. president. We just heard him list some examples when he was talking to Jimmy Kimmel. Um, but. It's clear in that interview as well that he likes the shock value, he likes to be a contrarian, uh. and he doesn't like when people tell him what to do. Jimmy Kimmel asked him a very simple question about what President Trump has done for the African American community, mm. and Kanye West was completely unprepared to answer that. And he could have pulled from a number of things. Jobs, like the president right. tweeted about, trying to fix the gang violence in Chicago, mm. the city that Kanye West is actually from. So it doesn't really feel like he's done a real deep dive into conservative values. Uh, but he did make some good points about at least not being bullied by people. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone uh, seriously expects Kanye West to be a rock-ribbed uh, conservative to turn into William F. Buckley or anything. Isn't it just the case that you've got people who are the most successful guys on the planet, they're major celebrities, and we live in a bizarre world where you can be one of the most successful people ever at what you do, and you're terrified to mistweet because you'll be clubbed to a pulp and your ca career will be over. And isn't there something refreshing just about a guy who says, uh, no, I'd like to be able to be free to say what I want? Yes, you know, I do think you're right. And what you said before kind of brings us to the Spike Lee point. Mm -hmm. What really struck me with what he had to say was that he wouldn't even sit down and talk to the president. No. Uh, I think he made some very good points in the interview with Anderson Co Cooper about uh, what's going, what happened with the Charlottesville riots and whatnot. But those points go nowhere if you're not willing to meet with the person in charge. LeBron James said the exact same thing, that he wouldn't sit at the same table with the president. So I do think that some of these ho famous people in Hollywood 
who could potentially score a White House invitation hate the president so much that they almost become their own worst enemies because they're not solving any problems here by just sort of screaming at other people that they hate the president and they don't like where this country is going. Well, they're, they're not just screaming. They're actually smashing his uh, star on the, uh, on the sidewalks of Hollywood. Uh, and they're actually turning to violence on that. And we're seeing some kind of pushback on the kind of vandalism of uh, Trump memorabilia. Yeah, an interesting headline today. There was um, a conservative Trump-supporting street artist that right. happens to live in California, which is a headline right there that there is yeah, somebody yeah. that I fits know. all those descriptions <laughs> that have, has been putting fake Hollywood Walk of Fame Trump stars because mm. President Trump's Hollywood Walk of Fame star was recently smashed with a pickaxe. Yep. It was destroyed mm. before. There's been uh, other celebrities, George Lopez... Yeah. did something vile to it or at I least know. pretended I to know. so there is one guy that's sort of fighting back in a way and you know it's just this laminated sheet there's no real damage done there no. and he's trying to make a political point but it's a, a witty point you you used a word uh contrarian and once once upon a time edgy pop culture figures used to like to be contrarian now they're plonking po-faced people uh who just uh, just want to be uh po-faced and serious about uh the, all this, all this stuff. We got, we got to go, Carly. Thanks for, thanks for that. We'll see you, you so on much. the TV imminently uh, tomorrow. You on Fox and Friends? That's right. Not tomorrow. Monday. Okay, Monday. <laughs> Glenn Greenwald is a dog lover, and so is Tucker. And after the break, they'll be back to discuss Glenn's special dog rescue operation, plus creepy porn lawyer news. That's next. <laughs> The creepy porn lawyer doesn't seem to spend much time lawyering, preferring to prance around on TV. Uh, now he'll be even more distracted. This week, creepy porn lawyer appeared at the Iowa State Fair. Creepy porn lawyers at state fairs, that's what's wrong with the world right there. And said he's uh, strongly considering a presidential run. Running for president is a great way to guarantee TV coverage, and if creepy porn lawyer doesn't get his TV fix, he's liable to shrivel up and die. If he does run, don't pay too much attention. Exposure to CPL can be very harmful to your health. The Intercept co-founder, Glenn Greenwald, has distinguished himself as a man on the left who hasn't uh, forsaken principles like due process, freedom of speech, and common sense in the name of opposing Donald Trump. But that's not all he does. Uh, he recently sat down with Tucker to discuss his dog rescue operation. First of all, God bless you for doing this. Tell us what it is, what you're doing, and how our viewers can help. Yeah, thanks, Tucker. So um, I've been rescuing dogs for a long time. My husband and I actually have 24 rescue dogs of our own at our house. Um, and about five years ago or so, um, you know, we fostered hundreds of dogs over the years. We started working with the homeless population here in Brazil that lives on the streets with their pets and discovered that the bond between homeless people and homeless dogs is even more kind of deep and profound um, because of their mutual deprivation than, say, the average suburban uh, family with a dog. And we decided we wanted to tap into that, so we actually started a shelter about a year ago that's designed to rescue abandoned animals from the street, but at the same time employ homeless people who have demonstrated an affinity for animals because they live with them and care for them so well on the street, employ them and then kind of transition them into uh, permanent employment and, and getting uh, housing. So we are growing it slowly. We um, have about 150 dogs um, that we currently have at the shelter. Oh. We've placed about three dozen already for adoption and we are employing about five homeless people. It's all crowdfunded by the public um, and we hope that it will inspire similar models around the world that take care of two different populations at the same time abandoned animals and homeless people what is it called so it's called the hope shelter um, it's actually an acronym that works well in Portuguese not quite as well in English but it's essentially <laughs> something like homeless people and pets together um, so it kind of works in, in English not quite as well as in Portuguese um, but it's it's really incredibly inspiring just to see when you give people who are homeless um, a purpose that they're already passionate about um, and then match them with dogs who have no nobody in the world and are suffering on the street from illness or injury um, and then find homes for them using the people who work there. It's incredibly gratifying. That's wonderful. D quickly, you've said you've got 24 dogs at home. What, that's kind of my dream. What's that like? That's a lot of dogs. 
It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, sometimes, of course, you know, as is true with your kids, say, you want to just murder them all. Um, but in general, um, it was my dream, too, when I was, you know, a kid, was just to have a huge um, stockpile of dogs um, that we rescued in. <laughs> And, of course, we have individual relationships with them, um, and they have these really amazing and intricate cliques and bonds with one another and these weird friendships that they form. Um, but we always said that 10 and then 12 and then 16 and then 20 was our limit. 24 is definitely our limit, so they all go to the shelter now. Um, but it's incredibly amazing. Our kids love them, um, and it's just great to have them around. That's, uh, it's, I have so many more questions, but we're out of time. But good for you. That is, that is the Lord's work. I'm totally convinced. Glenn Greenwell, thank you for that. Thank you, Tucker. Really appreciate it. Gotta love a great uh, dog story. Uh, that's it for us tonight. Tucker's going to be back on Monday. And Judge Janine is standing by with Hannity right now. Have a terrific weekend. Toodle.